Welcome back everybody to your daily update on something. Um, in this case, um, still the ladies' empire, although it's no longer the ladies, but just the empire in the north. What I mean is, I finished The Silver Spike, which is not a book of the official like Chronicles of the Black Company, but it kind of makes sense to read it between uh, The White Rose and uh, Shadow Games, because it's, you know, it kind of ties off a few loose ends at, you know, the northern stuff while the, the Black Company itself is marching to the south. So, um, that's what I did again and I really enjoyed it and I figured we have us a talk about it and uh, then tomorrow we're gonna start with Fall of Light. So yeah, let's let's get started because after this I'm gonna do the recording for the next Dresden Files chat with Cal from Really Good and Kind and my buddy John which you totally should check out. They're really great. We're having a good time there talking about Dresden Files novels. So do that. <laughs> All right, anyway, let's get started. <coughs> Cheers. All right. <clears throat> so, The Silver Spike. Um, once again, I'll, you know, not go too deeply into spoilers and stuff, but, you know, just put on my thoughts and things. Um, so it is kind of spoilery, if you have never read those. If you have not read it, I guess um, my overall review would be go read it. <laughs> I don't give stars, so this is going to be like, you know, go read it, it's great. It has some really good points and shows once again what a unique writer Glenn Cook is. And uh, that's that's about where it is. Um, it picks up with the people that, after the White Rose, stayed in the North, while Croker and the Lady and the rest of the Black Company started on their way south to return the Annals to Katawar. So... Most characters here this time around are um, Case and Raven, Darling and Silent, some other like those three brothers, the Torque brothers. They didn't have names in the book uh, in the White Rose, but those three brothers that stayed with uh, Darling and Silent, and our good old buddy Bowman's the ma uh, the sorcerer, also um, the Limper because that guy never goes away, and other things. And it's told by a good buddy, Case, whom you remember is the guy who kind of looks after Raven, and Raven teaches him how to read, and that guy. Uh, which is why it's not considered a, yeah, technically not a novel, either part of the Chronicles of the Black Company, because it's not written by an analyst of the Black Company. But so that's sort of where we're talking about here. And the ostensive plot, which is once again not you know super strong as a plot is um what happens to that silver spike or nail that uh, was used to catch the essence of the dominator at the end of the white rose you know it was like put into that tree and yeah the question is what happens to that and um how to say glenn cook is true to form he once again focuses on the small people those being um, like two cousins, Smeds and Tully, and two other guys, Timmy and Old Man Fish, who are um, kind of, you know, small time gangsters or, and other things. Not very good people, and they decide to go north and take that silver spike to sell it to a wizard. And we follow them, they succeed in bringing it to the city, and um, yeah. Stuff happens at the same time, Toad Killer Dog digs up the limper, and the limper goes on a rage. Now there's like some logic questions in there that I don't know how to deal with. I mean, um, all the other Taken lost their powers when the lady lost her powers at the end of the White Rose, but the, the limper still has his powers, which may, I have no idea why that worked or didn't work, but you know, who knows. Um, so yeah, we have that like whole plot there, um, and as I said, the, the plot is once again not the strong part of this. A lot of it's, it's like just traveling and fireworks and traveling and fireworks, with the limper raging all the way to the south to hunt down the lady and Croker, and Case and Raven following him, 
to um, following Case and uh, following Croker and the lady to warn them about you know the limper being after him or something like that, and then Lady uh, then Darling and. Silent City riding a wind whale down south to follow the limper and destroy the limper and then everyone realized that the spike of the dominator has been stolen <clears throat> And everyone runs back north to figure out what goes on there and how to how to get that spike So once again as I said like the plot isn't that like cool But a lot of other things are that we that I feel are important to look at here Those things are mostly um, characters, questions of, you know, um, like questions of personality, mostly you know, cowardice or bravery, stuff like that. And it's interesting because it's written by Case and a lot of it is the, about the relationship between or the character of Raven and... I think that's like probably the strongest characterization or character work that I've seen uh, from Glenn Cook so far. I mean, there's more in it later and stuff like that, but to look at in in the plain words, this plain language that uh, Glenn Cook uses for these books, especially with this one with a case, philodendron case, who is, um, by his own words, like a farmer's son who just learned how to write, and, you know. He uses plain language, but the discussion of Raven's character as someone who runs away from uh, emotional commitments, in a way, and uses um, dumb, lone wolf kind of bravery tactics to kind of make up for his weakness, his emotional weaknesses. This is something that, I mean, once again... Yeah, that's true. We, I, I know a lot of people who are like that. I was like that for a long time. I don't know if I changed that much, but you know. <laughs> um, the interesting thing, though, is that having it like presented this clearly is interesting for a book that's ostensibly still military fantasy. And uh, the relationship between Raven and Darling and Silent and Darling and those two men. And we have a lot, a lot of these things over the entire book where we see those two going all like dumb machismo on Darling trying to protect her trying to um, outdo each other in all kinds of things because they're both vying for her attention and um, both seem to have some kind of crush on her and a lot of it is about how both because they're like so obsessed and so like self-absorbed basically are like don't even consider her as a person, but just as, yeah, someone to be impressed, to be, like, almost like an object at this point. Um, once again, this is not, like, something, like, groundbreakingly new, but this is a book from, like, 89, and once again, the fantasy field in 1989 did not have a lot of <laughs> deep character studies of toxic masculinity, <laughs> to, put it, to put it mildly. So... I felt it was like just really interesting and refreshing to have that in there. Another thing that I found interesting is the character of Smed's stall. Was well, the only one who survived <laughs> at the end, of the, who who begins as an absolute wastrel. Like he he's like even more of a loser than his cousin Tully at the beginning, or at least so. We get told he's yeah he, he mostly gets drunk, uh, does like small time stuff. He seems to have a highly problematic sexual appetite for very young girls. I mean, very young is kind of difficult to uh, figure out. But I guess what we see here is once again like the what Cook does so well is to to show like the dark side, the underbelly of societies. Like those people are. All small-time criminals with no morals whatsoever, and poverty, and no like real social security net of any kind lead to a lot of like things that we nowadays might think of as, and rightly so, as morally reprehensible. Now, obviously, 
this is a fantasy book and it, it, it doesn't go deeply into that. We just like have that opening scene with Smids and those two girls. And uh, yeah. So I just want to say that that's an interesting aspect because I'm not sure if describing something like this nowadays in that casual way would would not get people um, very um, critical of the author in a way. But it's like, come on, it's a fantasy world. It shows the this shows like just depicts not even in a gratuitous way the fact that in a at like the lowest end of society, um, such things happen in a casual way because people don't think about you know have other things on their mind than um, the age of consent in a way. Anyway, um, what I really enjoyed about it is like how you see how Smeds over time realizes that. It becomes more of like a an actual like kind of clear thinking character. He's still not a nice guy. Don't get me wrong. Like no one in this story is a nice guy, with like the possible exception of um, Case or maybe Darling. But it's difficult to say even with those. Um, apart from that, like no one there is a nice guy, and Smeds certainly isn't one either. But we see him develops some kind of decency in a way, or not even decency, but you know, some kind of backbone and purpose in a way, <laughs> realizing how his cousin Tully was actually the, is actually the, the weaker of the two, like when it comes to like self-discipline and every, anything like that. Um, he's more treacherous than Smeds and everything. So the, the character arch of, uh, arc of um, Smeds is interesting because you almost come to like him, but you know, he, he still murders lots of people over time to protect himself and so forth. Which, I guess, once again, is that like whole theme of where uh, that we see a lot in the Black Company is like how extreme circumstances can like change people, make them uh, harder, um, bring out the best and the worst in them in a way. It's like, so you, there's a parallel, I guess, between Smed stalls on the one hand and Marin Shed in um, Shadows Linger that you can look at. So, but still, like, his character is a very fascinating one indeed, <laughs> especially when later on, when he joins the army, uh, is joined to the army, is press ganged, um, and he actually stands up to the bullying that he receives there, which is something he has never done before. It's like, he, yeah, that moment where people had decided that they have been pushed long enough and start pushing back, which is a theme that we see there in a lot more because we have the whole like um, <clears throat> uprising that city, that pressure cooker of a city in a way. And isn't that fascinating, like as a theme that we have the city? locked up everyone inside no one is allowed to leave because they are trying to find that silver spike and then when they finally destroy the limper at the end they do that by pressure cooking him so you have that reflection of the of themes there between like the city as this like pressure cooker of like society and then you have the, the actual like pot where they kind of pressure cook <coughs> the limper until they throw him into like a different plane at the end but you know <coughs> so yeah there's that But overall, I feel like the, the main theme really is that weird um, dynamic between Raven, Silent, and Darling, where those two men are, like, <clears throat> very much not um, respecting the uh, the personality or the, the actual personhood of Darling for maybe different reasons. Um, and, um, yeah. I mean, it kind of also is interesting because Darling is probably the character that we know the least about because he is um, a deaf mute, uh, mute and can only communicate through sign language, which, you know, is cool. Um, well, it kind of makes it even more difficult to, 
like get access because she's obviously not the person telling the stories. It's either Croker in the earlier books or now um, Case in this one. And the interesting thing there is that most of her gods. Fucking idiot. <clears throat> anyway, um, so <laughs> most of <laughs> most of like her dialogue is not even written as like actual dialogue, just reported on like an indirect way. It's like Darling said, "Let's do this," or she told us to do X or whatever. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's kind of interesting. She, she remains this like weird, distant symbol, which obviously is also like part of the thing that you have there that she is actually, you know. The White Rose is a symbol for the Rebellion, and you look at her, like, role both in the White Rose and the Silver Spike, it also is very much about, like, her emancipation, in a way, from just being that symbol into uh, being an actual person that takes act an active role in the Rebellion, that makes decisions, that plans things and gets them done. And has constantly has to, you know, kind of fight against the fact that she is a a woman. And there's a lot of like men who have <laughs> are by definition rather, you know <laughs> strong willed and uh, have uh, very outmoded ideas about <laughs> <laughs> women's right to command, I guess. But on the other hand, you know, the lady commanded the Empire, so that worked as well. But, you know, that might just be because of if you have enough, like, power, it doesn't matter what gender you are. Or, um, yeah, so there, there's that. But I feel like even, like, with this one, like, it was even more about the whole idea of these, like... Like, a study of, almost like a study of toxic masculinity in Raven, or, like, in Silent probably as well, but more in what Raven would, like, running away from emotional, um, um, yeah, from emotional entanglement as much as possible, <clears throat> doing over-the-top, um, like, things, um, that are really dumb on the surface just to prove or, like, to demonstrate your power or whatever. Yeah, thinking in symbols, I guess, is the problem there. Like, you do these, like, really dumb shit. And, like, as I said, I've done my part of, like, dumb <laughs> shit. <laughs> Instead of actually, you know, just acknowledging emotions and actually facing them. <clears throat> and in this case, it kind of, like, the, the ending is fitting because there's no way, unfortunately, at this point, for some people to get out of that habit. It, it has been drilled into a lot of people from, like, early on, the whole, like, you know, keep your emotions in, you... Yeah, as I said, like, and a lot of media that we consume is obviously um, geared towards that. It's like, you have all these tough guy people doing all this dumb shit, and <laughs> until fairly recently, it wasn't even, you know, shown to be, like, problematic. It's like a lot of like our your seventies and eighties, um, like action movie heroes and stuff like that. People like that are exactly those people that have problems with like <laughs> acknowledging their emotions and then go for like really dumb action instead. So I really appreciated that. Another fact that I found fascinating is um, the. Um, discussion about the Empire. The uh, when Toad Killer Dog comes back um, to the tower, and the idea that you know that whole idea of like the three phases of Empire of the um, the conquerors, the administrators, and those who you know waste the Empire in the end. It's a very basic theory, and not exactly something that I necessarily subscribe to. But it's certainly something that you can see in. Right, like, I guess it's something I've said before, it's like, theory, or academic theories, even disproven, disproved ones, or like, disputed theories, can make for solid, you know, um, 
um, material for for a novel because this is fiction. You don't have to agree with that theory of the of the conqueror, the administrator, and the waster, um, but you can certainly use it to explain something. And there's you know a a certain basis or like evidence in some historical parts where that kind of thing works with the Roman Empire or whatever you have in mind. And so we see the the ladies empire becoming the empire with the lady gone and now the limper as well gone and the, the, the dominator destroyed and everything's like and the administrators take over which is helpful you know it's kind of the same thing when you look at the malazan book of the fawn <laughs> that is exactly what happens at the i guess after return of the crimson guard or thereabouts um in a way so it's novels of the Malazan Empire, but so like what happens with the Malazan Empire there as well is like this idea that conquerors are not necessarily made to rule an empire or keep a, an empire stable and um, prosperous, I guess, because their mode is a different one. The mode is to just go and conquer and solve things militarily and not exactly think about how good stuff is at home because that's not their focus. So we see Glenn Cook in, you know, insert a little bit of like theory and stuff like that in there, which is super fascinating because this is the last time we talk about the Empire. It's, after that, it's just gone or like the focus is somewhere else. So we don't hear about any of that anymore. It's just like, oh, by the way, here's a bit of like stuff that happens with the, with the Empire, uh, by the way. Um, yes. I'm not so sure, like, some th things that I didn't like that much was, like, the whole, like, trip of the limper to the south and then back again. It kind of felt a bit rushed in a way because it's just, like, he goes and destroys city after city in a way and then he just turns back. It's like, I, I get that point in a way because it's all about, like, everyone almost <laughs> nearly finding Croker and then just, like, everyone running back because something more important happens there. <laughs> and uh, we'll see about that in... Um, uh, Shadow Games, when I talk about that, probably tomorrow or whenever, how some of those events are portrayed by Croker in his narrative uh, as well. But, uh, yeah, it still felt like the whole way there and back felt a bit rushed or, you know, yeah, I guess rushed is the main theme there. It's like, yes. We we realize the limper is now completely mad and driven just by anger even more than before. I get that, but still, you know. Um, so yeah, that's sort of my my like guess largest issue with it. The whole part in the city with them trying to you know hide and everything and that making Smeds further, like, more, like, tougher, I guess, but also forcing him to do more, like, violent deeds <laughs> is an interesting aspect of the fact that, like, if you start that career of doing something so, like, dealing with something so dark and evil, if you deal with evil, chances are it'll corrupt you further and further in a way, even though you might just be a... A good guy underneath in a way it's like it'll force you to do make more like dark choices and i guess that's something that we've also all felt before it's like we make mo one mistake and it kind of usually forces us to make more mistakes and more moral mistakes whether it's lying like out of necessity at some point and then you're just forced to pile up more lies and lies and lies or other stuff like that you know so there's there's that aspect and then obviously the end when fish just dies of cholera which once again, yeah, that, that's how life works. There's no justice, and there's no overarching, you know, intelligence guiding our life's paths in a way that makes sense to anyone. That's not how that's not how the universe works. It may have a cruel sense of humor and irony sometimes, but even that is us imposing that cruel sense of irony and <laughs> and humor on something that is in the end. Meaningless, I guess. So yeah, there's that. But, you know, Case and Darling ride off into the sunset and become farmers. 
And that should give us hope, because at least someone got out of there, and that's cool. Anyway, that's sort of my thoughts on the White Rose. I'll um, go through the next one, through um, Shadow Games in the next day or two, but tomorrow there will be Fall of Light. Anyway, have a great Sunday night, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Until then, cheers.